Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Our text this evening is primarily going to be verses 7 through 9. Thank you for being here. Your presence, coming to worship God, coming to study His Word, is an encouragement to me. Your singing has lifted up my soul. I have never heard, Behold Our God, before. Man, I love that song. That is fantastic. And you guys sang it wonderfully to make me love it even more. Well, we have a challenge in front of us. We want to cover the subject of overcoming obstacles. That is something that all of us will face, and all of us need to be prepared for. It is, as has been stated, an eminently practical lesson. And in Matthew 18, verses 7 through 9, Jesus has three things to talk to us about obstacles. But before we get there, I'd like for us to get the context that leads up to Jesus' discussion on obstacles. In verse 1, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? My clicker's not working. You know, thank you. That was my first obstacle. (laughs) That particular question in verse 1 is a little bizarre to me. Have any of you ever felt like asking that question? Have you ever been at a church, you come to be a part of a church, say, I'm going to place membership at this congregation, and I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be the most glorified, well-known Christian at this church. You ever had desires or goals like that? Or to have it even bigger, because that's not the goal that they have. They're not looking at, well, I want to be the biggest, greatest in this little local body. They are talking about the kingdom of God. I want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. When we get to heaven, I want to be number one. I've never had aspirations like that. My goal is to get there. And if I am the least well-known, the least popular, nobody wants to be around me, I don't care if I got there. And that's kind of the way Jesus answers the question. They've asked who's the greatest in the kingdom. And in verse 2, he says, He called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. They want to be greatest. And he says, here's what you're going to have to do to get in. You're going to have to become innocent like a child, humbled like a child, small like a child. And then the next thing he says, verse 4, Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what he just did? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? everyone. He just said, you can't get in the kingdom unless you become like a child, and if you become like a child, you'll be the greatest in the kingdom. And he's not saying that, if Peter's the one who's asking this, he's not saying this, so Peter, I want you to understand how important you're going to be. That is not his point. His point is not about their individual greatness. His point is about the greatness of everybody else in the kingdom. Everyone in the kingdom is the greatest. Everyone is of great significance because what he is then going to do is say, it is now very important that you treat everyone well because there is nobody in the kingdom of God who is insignificant. You hurt one of them, you have hurt the most significant person in the kingdom. Because what he does in the next verse, in verse 5, says, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Now that's different than what he did in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, he was in illustrating their significance. In verse 40, he says, He who receives you receives me. See, you're important in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 18, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. They are important. So now, how do we get who's the greatest in the kingdom? Well, 
first get in the kingdom by being a child. If you're like a child, you are the greatest in the kingdom. And since everybody in the kingdom is like a child, everybody is greatest. So therefore, you must be careful how you treat anybody in the kingdom. And then verse 6, he goes on, he says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. That's kind of harsh language. And when Jesus uses language like that, we really have to pay attention. I mean, we should always pay attention to Jesus our Lord. Every little thing he tells us, we should be paying close attention. But when he's putting emphasis on a statement like that, we've got to pay even closer attention. You are better off dead than to mistreat a Christian. And in so doing, what he has done is he has begun the subject of a stumbling block of somebody who is tripping up Christians, who is making it more difficult for them to be Christians. And that gets us to our subject, verses 7 through 9, in which Jesus is going to make three points about stumbling blocks. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to that man through whom the stumbling blocks comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you, for it is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. So Jesus is making three points there. The first one is stumbling blocks are inevitable. The second one is, don't be the stumbling block. And the third one is, don't let anything cause you to stumble. Whatever it is you face, overcome it. Those are the three points that he's emphasizing there. I want to deal with all three of them, really just two that are my focus, but let's deal with that second one. I don't want to just ignore it. We really want to talk about us overcoming our obstacles, but let's take a moment where Jesus has just told us, don't be the stumbling block. See again in verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. And look at the end of verse 7, woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks comes. We will all face stumbling blocks. We will all face challenges. Don't be the challenge for anybody. In Matthew chapter 13, when Jesus is giving us the explanation of the parable of the tares, He gives us this picture of the judgment scene in which the Lord has allowed the kingdom to grow, but there are some within the kingdom who don't belong in the kingdom, and in the judgment scene, He's going to separate them. And only those who belong in heaven are going to go to heaven, and those who have been in our midst but don't belong to heaven won't go to heaven. He describes those who aren't going to heaven, who are in our midst but don't belong, who are in our midst but won't get to the end in two ways, two different groups. Verse 41 says, The Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so he gives us another strong language, this weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says, this is the furnace of fire that is reserved for those who are one of these two groups. One is those who commit lawlessness. And that one's really obvious to us. The people who embrace sin, who say, whatever God says to do, they say, I don't care what God tells me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. We get that. They're not going to go to heaven. But that other group was the stumbling blocks equal to those who are rebellious and don't pay any attention to laws, are those who cause others to stumble. By the way, if you're paying any attention to the Greek, it's the same word. It's the same word that he's using here in, in Matthew 13 as he's using in Matthew chapter 18 in regards to stumbling blocks. In Romans chapter 14, this, this chapter about differences you and I can have opinions 
preferences, things that we can be different in and still be pleasing to God, things that we can be different in and hopefully still get along with one another. And he says in verse 13, Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather determine this, determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. Do not be the Christian who makes Christianity harder for the person next to you. That's what Jesus is starting off with an emphasis on. I don't, I don't mean to embarrass you, Bonnie, and I did not tell you I was going to do this, so you can just kind of ignore this for a second, because I do this normally when she's not here. But Bonnie has been on a diet for the last year. And I don't, I've had so many people come up to me or her and say, what is she doing? Because she has lost a significant amount of weight in one year. And she has been very disciplined. If there is sugar in front of her, she says no. To the point where if it's a piece of bread, she says no. And she has amazed me in this regard. I think about the worst thing I could do then is to day in and day out keep saying, yeah, but Bonnie, donuts. Let's have donuts today. Let's do pizza tonight. We should, and I could constantly be pushing her and nudging her and trying to chip away at this amazing thing she's doing. And Jesus is saying, don't be that person spiritually. We are in this pursuit, and it's a challenging pursuit to serve God and to be pleasing to God. Don't be that person who is chipping away at our morality and at our strength. Don't be the person who, who, if we're looking at a movie, is saying, yeah, you know, that's not that big of an issue, the stuff that's in that. Let's go ahead and go see it. Don't be that person. If you're within your family, don't be the person who is saying, you know what, it would just be easier to stay home today. It'd just be easier to not go this time. You know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just not really into it. Don't be the person who is pushing the family further from God. Be the one who is making the people around you stronger, more moral, more holy, more dedicated. But that's what Jesus is saying there. Woe to those who are the stumbling blocks. But that's not really the emphasis that I want us to have. I want us to focus on the first point and the third point. First point now is, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. And I hope that you will allow me to change that language just a little bit. It's going to help us a bit on this next slide. We're going to stop talking about stumbling blocks, and we're going to talk about obstacles. Stumbling blocks have a very negative connotation. Obstacles just are challenges. There are things that can trip us up. They're not quite as negative in their mind. And that's important because I'm going to ask, why are obstacles inevitable? Why is it inevitable that in our pursuit of, of going to heaven, our pursuit of pleasing God, it will be difficult? Why is that inevitable? And there are two reasons. God and Satan. Satan. There are two reasons why you and I, all of us, will face challenges. And the first one is God. If you go over and you read Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel. Moses is about to die. The people of Israel are about to enter into the promised land. For 40 years they have been wandering. And those 40 years have not been a vacation for them. There has been challenge after challenge after challenge. And you might wonder, why have there been so many challenges? And God answers that saying, I'm the reason for some of it. So in verse 2, he says, You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you into the wilderness these 40 years, that He might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. Some of the challenges, some of the difficulties, some of the commands that weren't so easy to keep or easy to understand were there to find out who are you? Who are you really? An opportunity for us to prove ourselves. And so God puts in front of us tests, opportunities to prove ourselves. And the next verse, in verse 3, he says, He humbled you and let you be hungry. 
There were times when God let them know what it felt like to be hungry. He goes on and says, And fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And so some of the challenges, some of the difficulties we face are to teach us. So it's not easy so that we will learn. If you go down to verse 16, In the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. And this is a very important aspect of God. All of these challenges, all these tests, they're not to destroy you. They're to help you. His ultimate goal is to make us stronger. His ultimate goal is to give us blessings. So why do we go through challenges? Because God puts them there. But that's not the only answer. God does all of those things to help us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to get us on the right path. Satan, on the other hand, he's trying to destroy us. One of the most foolish things that Christians do is go through life like we don't have an enemy. Like we don't have this incredibly intelligent, powerful enemy focused on destroying us. We don't have an easy go because Satan doesn't want us to have an easy go of things. Satan is out to destroy us. Matthew 24 and verse 24, though it does not specifically mention Satan, it's like his fingerprints are all over this verse. For, for false Christ and false prophets, well, where are they coming from? This is Satan's handiwork. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. And this classic passage in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 is of us having an enemy. He says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Peter is saying, wake up. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He is constantly searching. He is constantly striving to destroy us. Have you thought about that today? What happened to you today to destroy you? Every now and then we ought to stop and think about it. And maybe it would be smarter instead of waiting till the end of the day, maybe if we started at the beginning of the day and we thought, all right, today is a good day. I'm thankful for the day. God, praise you for this day. And stop and think, and what's Satan going to do about it? What's he going to do to me? Because he's going to try. We face obstacles because God wants to help us. We face obstacles because Satan wants to destroy us. So Jesus has said in Matthew chapter 18, it is inevitable that uh, blo <laughs> stumbling blocks will come. It's inevitable. Here's why. Because God is going to test us, and Satan is striving to destroy us. But go back to Matthew 18. Jesus is not done using strong language. Because he now turns his attention on this idea of letting nothing stop us. And so he says, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. Again, very strong language. And just about every time I've heard that passage brought up in Bible class or by a preacher, I hear the term hyperbole. You guys familiar with that? Somebody reads this passage and say, hey, Jesus isn't speaking literally, he's using hyperbole. I think we're making a grave mistake when we do that. Now, Jesus may in fact be using hyperbole. He may be using exaggeration to make a point. But I've got to tell you, if Jesus is using exaggeration to make a point, our solution to come to the right point is not to minimize his language. 
If he's using exaggeration, there's a reason he's using exaggeration, and we should look at the big picture. And I've got to tell you, what if it is your hand that's between you and heaven? What should you do? The thing about it isn't isn't that it's an exaggeration, it's that it's it's not practical. I've never known somebody who really, it was their eye or their hand or their foot that's keeping them from heaven. But the point remains absolutely true. If it ever were... You want to know how convicted we should be in following God? You want to know how dedicated we should be towards getting to heaven? This hand, this eye, this foot, nothing. I will get rid of it because what comes next is worth it. When Jesus talks about overcoming obstacles, Jesus is teaching us, do whatever it takes to overcome. Now, maybe it is cutting off a hand, but oftentimes that's not what it's going to look like. But if we get this exaggeration, everything else we face should be obvious what to do. So let me give you some illustrations. Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. And why don't we start in verse 1. Speaking of Jesus, it says, He entered Jericho and was passing through. Uh, Jesus is on His way to Jerusalem. Jesus is on His way to die for your sins and my sins on the cross. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So you have this man, Zacchaeus, and he's got the right idea I don't know what his reasoning is, what it is about Jesus he wants to see, but he wants to see Jesus. At that time, there was nothing better you could want. But there's a crowd. That's an obstacle. That's his first obstacle. And Zacchaeus could have said... Well, I've learned a valuable lesson. If you want to see Jesus, you got to get up early in the morning. He could have learned that lesson and gone home, and it would have been a terrible mistake because Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die on the cross. This is his last chance. He may not know it, but this is his last chance to see Jesus. So what does he do? Verse 4, so he ran on ahead. Remember, this is a grown man who's rich, And now he's running. I don't think that their society is quite like our society. We have this crazy thing, and I truly do believe it's crazy. Sorry, Bonnie and Nathan. But running, I think, is crazy. People that just go into the marathons and they run, that's not what they did in those societies. He looked weird. You got this grown, rich man running down the street. Who cares what it looks like? This is what it's going to take for him to see Jesus. And he's a pretty smart guy because as he's running along, he figures, I get in front of the crowd, but I didn't get taller. And so now he knows what he needs to do. He's got to go climb a tree. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree. And ignoring you hunters for a second, when's the last time you saw an adult climb a tree? An adult rich man climb a tree. It's just another obstacle for this man. And he's going to do it because whatever it takes to see Jesus, he's going to do. There is no stopping Zacchaeus. So when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And now we have an obstacle for the crowd. Because Zacchaeus is a rich tax collector, which makes him about as awful as a person could be. A tax collector was, first of all, foremost, a traitor. They were somebody who served Rome instead of the Jewish people, God's people. A rich tax collector was not just a traitor, but a thief. He was somebody who was stealing from the people to make himself rich while betraying the people to serve Rome. And Jesus has just said, I want to go to your house. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And so that's an obstacle for them, and they're going to have to decide if they're going to overcome that or not. And we don't find out what they do. But in verse 8, Zacchaeus reveals there's another obstacle that just is no problem for him. And I guess that's not surprising, given the way he's behaved so far. 
Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. I'll give half of what I have, and if I've done anything wrong to anybody, I will fix it, and I will fix it right. I will give them four times as much as I've taken from them. What a contrast this is from Luke chapter 18 with this guy that I adore. Luke chapter 18, there's this guy, we call him the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and says, What do I have to do to him? receive eternal life. You want to beat a question like that? That's the right question. And Jesus says you need to keep the commands. He says, which ones? Jesus lists them out, and he says, I've done all that from my youth. Don't you like this guy? He's come to the right person with the right question, and his life is in order. And I like him because he didn't ask the next question. It's Matthew that records this, Matthew 19, that adds, he says, what else am I lacking? And that's when Jesus says, sell what you've got. That's an obstacle. And for this man, it was like being told, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye. He's talking about eternal life but he chooses his wealth. That obstacle was just too much for him. He wouldn't overcome it. So when you contrast Zacchaeus, who's running, climbing trees and saying, I'll give up my stuff, it's such an interesting contrast when you have the rich young ruler who says, I'll be really faithful and really righteous and really good, but I won't give up my stuff. Another example is in Mark chapter 2 of people overcoming obstacles. Mark chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. So we have this crowd surrounding Jesus, inside a house, and there's no way to get inside the house. And you have these four guys who are really good friends. And I don't know whether they're family members. I don't know anything about them other than they're behaving like really good friends because they've got this guy who's a paralytic, and they know the only solution is inside this room. The only solution is Jesus. And so their first obstacle is the guy can't walk. So they carry him. They get to the place, and there's a crowd. You can't carry a paralytic through a crowd in a house. They can't do it. So they go home, say maybe Jesus will be available the next time. They do exactly what Zacchaeus did. They climbed. By the way, that couldn't have been easy either. Climbing a house with a paralytic, but they climbed up. They climb up and they don't find a door and they don't find a window. So they dig. I've been on top of my roof. I've never looked at the roof and said, you know, the fastest way for me to get back into the house would just be go straight through this. But that's what they did. I don't know whose house they're at, but I'm pretty sure there's somebody inside the house and all of a sudden some dirt starts coming, trickling down, and you hear these noises. I can't imagine Jesus is still teaching at this point. Everybody's got to be looking up going on. What is going on? Now, if I'm these four guys, I've got to know what I'm doing is not making somebody happy. But this ceiling is between me and the Lord, and it will not stop me. And so they dug through got through, and behold, more than they could have dreamed of happened. Jesus looks at this man, this paralytic, and says, your sins are forgiven. And then says, you can go. Pick up your pallet and walk. He's allowed to walk. But what I want you to understand is be a Zacchaeus or be one of these four guys in your spiritual walk. You're going to face obstacles. You're going to face challenges. They're going to be difficult, but no matter what they are, no matter how difficult they are, overcome them. Let nothing stop you. 
uh, Bonnie works from home now, and one of the blessings from that is that uh, she gets breaks and we get to walk through our neighborhood. And I've learned something about walking on sidewalks. They're not all perfect. They have cracks. And I've learned something about the cracks. The big ones will trip you. And the small ones will trip you. And in our life, we're going to face some big obstacles, and we're going to face some small obstacles, and any of them can trip you. You've got to pay attention to every challenge, whether you think it's a big one or a small one. All of them can trip you. And you want to know what else? Any of them can be avoided. If you're paying close attention, if you're careful in the way you walk, the small obstacles are nothing. And the big obstacles are avoidable, overcomable at the very least. Now, if I were to go back and think about those people that came out of, Israel, uh, out of Egypt, they faced a lot of obstacles. They really did. Uh, and, and I don't want to go spend a lot of time in all of these, but they, they faced the, an obstacle of nostalgia. There was a point where they completely went out of their mind and forgot their past. And they start complaining and saying, I wish we were back in Egypt and we had food in Egypt. And they completely forgot that their kids were being killed in Egypt and they were begging God for help and they were slaves. But sometimes we forget our problems in the past. And you know what that is? That's an obstacle when we forget our past. And, and, and sometimes we just have the uncertainty like they did with Moses. Moses went up on top of the mountain and he's gone for over a month and they don't know what's happened to him. And that was their obstacle. We don't know what happens next. We don't know what to do. That's an obstacle. Sometimes our obstacle is just undefined. In, in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, it doesn't even tell us what their problem was. They were just unhappy. It's like sometimes you wake up and you're just not in a good mood. It's basically like a whole nation did that. And that's an obstacle. Sometimes you wake up with an obstacle, and it's your mood. But you go down just a little bit further in Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, and let's pay a little closer attention to the next ones. Numbers 11, verses 4 through 6, he says, So Moses said to the Lord, Okay, I can count. Verse 4, The rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we used to have, uh, which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to eat, look at except this manna. And this is a really weird thing, but sometimes the obstacle we have is the blessings we have. You see that? They're complaining that all they have is manna. Manna is described as bread from heaven, food of angels, and they're complaining about it. And I used to give them a really bad time about that. Oh, these Israelites, always complaining. But then Bonnie and I went to Israel with a group of Christians, a group of great Christians, really enjoyed the time we had with them. We are there for, I don't know, maybe 10 days, driving around on a bus, about four days in, in Israel, all the Christians started complaining about the food we were getting. And I suddenly realized we didn't even make it through five days, and we started complaining. So they're not right, but I understand we're not better. We do it awfully easily. But here, God is giving them, just giving them food, and that's their obstacle. When I say obstacles come in all shapes and sizes, I mean it. Sometimes it's obviously bad things. Sometimes it's good things that are our challenges. Uh, the obstacle of being upset about your role in Numbers chapter 13. I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 12. In verse 2, Miriam and Aaron come up to Moses. They say, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it, and it's not going to go well from there. That's not fair, Moses. You're setting yourself up. We're just as good as you are. We're just as important as you are. It didn't go well for Miriam here. She's going to get leprosy for a while. But, you know, people weren't paying attention because in Numbers chapter 16, you have the rebellion of Korah, and it's the exact same rebellion. They assembled together, and this is verse 3, they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And it's not going to go well for them at all. Sometimes it's our role. I'm more important than this. I deserve more than this. We live in a society that cannot stand 
the fact that we have a different role for women than we do for men. And I can't tell you the purpose behind all of that. I'm not going to give you all the explanations. We don't need them. It's just going to be an obstacle sometimes. You don't get to do everything you want to do, and neither do I. You want to be an elder? You can't be an elder? Neither can I. Bonnie and I don't have children. We do not meet the qualifications. Even if I wanted that role, I can't have it. Our roles can be an obstacle. Get through it. Don't let it trip you up. In, in Numbers 14, the obstacle is we've got giants in front of us and they're just scared. If we fast forward through the people's time into the time period of um, uh, right when the northern kingdom is being destroyed by the Assyrians, the Assyrians are coming down against uh, the Judah. And this servant of Assyria says some pretty interesting things to me. In, in uh, second, sorry, I want this one. <laughs> It turns out if you use the laser pointer back there, nothing happens. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 18. And in 2 Kings chapter 18, the Assyrians have just been walking all over the map of the earth, conquering every nation they've come across. They're unlike anything the world has seen. And now they're right outside of Jerusalem. And they're telling Jerusalem, you really ought to just surrender. You ought to surrender because you can't beat us. And he says several things and makes several arguments, but it's the last ones that I want to focus on. So if, if you pick up in verse 29, it says, So thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you from my hand. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this, this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me. And come out to me, and each of you, and eat each of his own vine, and each of his fig tree, and drink each of the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. But do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharphim, Hina, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their land from my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? By the way, things don't go well for him. That, that, that's the, a really good way to, to mess things up, is to say God can't do anything. But that's really his argument. His argument is that God and that God and that God and that God, they all thought their gods could save them, and they couldn't. This is an obstacle for me because I see this religion and this religion and this religion and this religion and that religion, and I think, what are the odds I've got the right religion? And that's an obstacle, an obstacle I have to overcome. Well, if we get to the New Testament, the obstacles continue on. And one of the obstacles that really people today can relate with is the obstacle of bad disciples, misbehaving disciples. In Matthew chapter 15, in verse 21, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, why didn't she quit? When she tried and Jesus didn't say anything. Why didn't she quit when she tried and the disciples start begging Jesus, send her away, get her out of here? We don't care about her kid. We don't care about her. She keeps shouting at us and we don't like her. Make her go. Why would you keep following Jesus then? 
You know why? She had a problem. And there was only one solution on earth. Her daughter was cruelly demon possessed, and she loved her daughter, and Jesus was the only one who could save her. She would not be stopped. She would not be stopped if she didn't understand or agree with Jesus' behavior. She would not be stopped if she did not like or agree with the disciples' behavior. She would not be stopped, and she was not stopped. She got what she was looking for. Her daughter was healed. But that kind of plays out multiple times. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 13, there's some children who are brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And here are the disciples, they're rebuking them, saying, get away from Jesus, you, don't, you shouldn't be with him. Or, or Matthew chapter 20, verses, uh, 20, verse 29 you have these blind men, and they, they were leaving Jericho. A, a, a large crowd followed him, and two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more. Sometimes Christians will not treat you nicely. We've heard many times people say, I, I, I don't want anything to do with church because Christians are hypocrites. Sometimes they are. But should that stop you? If the only solution to your ultimate problem, and we could refer to that as your ultimate problem is sin, and the only solution is Jesus, should some hypocritical Christian stop you? Or maybe we should refer to our, the other universal problem, one that people kind of are more imminently aware of, and that is death. And the only solution to death is Jesus. Will a few misbehaving Christians stop you? You're going to have stumbling blocks. It's going to happen. And it's going to come within the church. And it's going to come from preachers and from elders. How many times have we heard in the news preachers who have been caught in various inappropriate behavior. I have a, a relative who's a preacher, and he started work at a congregation, and, and uh, as soon as he started work, they realized that previous preacher had embezzled $400,000 from them. Should the church quit? Yeah, he was wrong. He was sinful. He's going to have to answer to God. Don't let anything make you quit. Don't let anyone make you quit. Well, it could be the physical attributes, height. It could be own possessions like Zacchaeus or the rich young ruler. Or it could be this parable of Luke 14, you know, where I have land, I have a wife, I have work. There's always obstacles. There will always be obstacles. But if you should cut off your hand, if you should cut off your foot or your, pluck out your eye, then any of the obstacles you face, you should overcome. You do know what the worst joke in the world is, right? I, I, I guess that's opinion. I state it like it's fact, but I'm pretty sure it's opinion. Um, why'd the chicken cross the road? Worst joke in the world. To get to the other side... Great spiritual lesson, though. Why did the people of Israel cross the wilderness? To get to the other side. Why did Jesus endure the cross? To get to the other side. Why will we face the obstacles? To get to what's on the other side. To get to the reward. To get to the goal. So my question for you is, what obstacles do you face? Put a name to them. Jesus did. Get behind me, Satan, he said to Peter. He identified that Peter, at that moment, was not helping him, was not working for him, but was working against him. And so he identified and said, you are Satan. When there's something in your life that is an obstacle to your path to heaven, name it. You are my obstacle. 
You are from Satan. You are trying to trip me up. And if you can identify it and name it, it's a whole lot easier to get past it. Just like the sidewalk. If I see the crack, it's easy for me not to fall. If I don't see it, it's easy for me to fall. So what are you willing to let stop you? What are you willing to overcome? From now and from this point forward, I hope that we will have this resolve that says, I will not quit. I will not be stopped. And maybe the problem is, you know, you're you're ignorant of God's Word. Many people will talk about that. The thing I have a problem with that is people are able to binge things on Netflix or whatever streaming service you're using. If you can binge that, why can't you binge the Bible? Why can't we just dig, dig into the Bible? If your obstacle is ignorance, dig in. Maybe we have the obstacle of it's so challenging for me to share my faith. That's just an obstacle. Overcome it. Maybe your obstacle is COVID. COVID has brought forth a lot of obstacles for us, hasn't it? For some people, it was an obstacle towards that kept them from being loving. My right, my face, my arm, I'm going to choose what I want to do with no regard to what's best for the people around me. And other people, it's been an obstacle where they have become comfortable at home. And please understand, I am thankful for online service. I am thankful for it. And I'm fearful of it. I'm thankful that we've had opportunity to continue to worship when there was a time when we thought maybe it's not best for us to be together. I'm thankful for those who are shut-ins because I got a, a firsthand perspective of what it's like to be at home alone and not with anybody else. And I'm thankful they've got something because something is better than nothing. But I worry about it becoming a crutch for people, about it becoming easy Or maybe your problem is pornography. In a room this size, I assure you, there's more than one who has a problem with pornography. And it's not like we don't know it, that it's wrong. It's a struggle. In my case, Bonnie has access. I I use a, a, a program called Accountable to You. Bonnie has access to every text I send, every email, every website I look at, every Google search I do from my my computer, my tablet, my phone. She has access to all of those things, and it's not because she's a controlling woman. I have given her that access because I believe my eternal soul is more valuable than my privacy. I believe that my eternal soul is more important than my phone. And if it would be necessary, I should be willing to cut off my phone. If I could cut off a hand, why not our phone? Why not our TV? You getting the picture? We all face obstacles, and I don't know what yours is, but you're facing something. And Jesus is saying, do whatever it takes to overcome. Well, I want to consider one final thing. I appreciate your attention so much. It's important for us to understand our enemy. And Satan is our enemy, but his tactics had to change. You see, in the Garden of Eden, his, his tactics were very simple. He takes Adam and Eve, and he only has to do one thing. He only has to get them to take one bite. All he has to do is get them to sin. And they're lost. And it's over. But that's not enough for you. You see, because Jesus died to forgive us of our sins, 
And so Satan can get us to sin, but that's not the end. There's a solution to sin. There is forgiveness of sins that is offered to us. So Satan needs a new tactic. And you know what his new tactic is? To get you to quit. It's not enough to knock you down. He's got to make it so you don't get back up. We face obstacles. So why did the Christian face the obstacles? To get to the other side. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become one this morning, uh, this evening. And right now, I can't tell what time it is. We encourage you to become a Christian this evening. The water is ready. Be baptized into Christ. If you're a Christian and you have stumbled, 